we assemble this as an operating system. So the goal is to be, uh, think of it like electricity. And so if you have existing core HR systems, existing LXPs, LMSs, uh, existing ATS systems or talent marketplaces, you want all of those systems speaking a consistent language of jobs and skills across your organization. We, we call this the automation of the job and talent architecture. And so in order to find out where you need to go, you first need to understand where you are. And really that's uh, what we call horizon one uh, in terms of implementations that we do across large organizations, which is helping automate the job and talent architecture. And so the goal is not to create a, another workflow. The goal is to complement the existing technologies that you have and serve as a system of intelligence or electricity into those uh, applications. And so what does all this mean with respect to the work that, that Fuse and, and Skyhive are doing together? So um, obviously when a, a, a worker or a learner is going on a journey, you know, a learning journey, you have them starting at point A and the intention is to travel to point B. And what we've seen in, in recent history is, you know, uh, think of the worker learner as the driver of the vehicle and think of the vehicle as uh, a technology like Fuse. And so it's a, it's a Ferrari. It's fantastic. It's, it's doing exactly what's, what it's intended to do for the worker and learner. And with Skyhive, um, think of it as the GPS. And so not only is it going to give the calculation of the most efficient way from A to B uh, on the uh, skilling journey, but it's also going to indicate during the, 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 the journey if something changes and how to adapt at an individual departmental company wide level to those changes. And so uh, thank you for your time and uh, hope that uh, you were able to take some nuggets of value. I really appreciate that. And I think you've got some, um, some good questions that have come up. You want to jive into the, the Q&A around that. Um, I think... Also, there's some there's some great comments in, in the chat there. I think again, language, language, semantics, and I think Bob makes a point and good to say it's good, great to see you, Bob, um, around definition of the word skill. And, and I think Sean, you you have a pretty good broad understanding of that, right? So I do think that a lot of people use the term skills very broadly, but you you do actually come right down to actually the task and knowledge level, which I know is something that Charles that Charles is um passionate about, right? That you know. I think there are a lot of people out there that talk about skills and they're talking at a really kind of like generic type level. But actually, you know, with you guys and what we're doing together is we're talking about those both high level skills, but actually right down to task level. And we'll talk about that a bit more in terms of how that all plugs in. That's right. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. So if you want, maybe in the background, if you could jump into the Q&A and maybe we'll dive into Charles, which is a nice little bridge in there, especially I think Debbie came in talking about competencies and skills and so forth. So uh, over to you, Charles. Uh, thanks very much, Steve. And and just building on what you said, Sean, I'm really sort of it's it's great that you linked in jobs and skills and tasks, because I think that there's some big issues around, you know, the whole area of sort of skills and competence and things like that. So I want to just step up a level and talk about AI in the context of value creation and what that means. And I thought I'd just address this issue about competence or expertise, because uh, I noticed that Debbie Carlton and uh, Bob Mosher also in the in the chat we're talking about the challenges we've got in terms of language we use. And uh, uh, the way the competence, I think L&D has been dragged into an HR mindset around competence, competency frameworks and so on for years. Uh, and the way I see it is this, in today's world, competence actually is not enough. We need experts. Uh, and the job market pressure is for expertise. And we know that expertise provides a lot more value to its organization than competence. And we've, again, HR has always had this nice normal curve in terms of a performance, but people like Herman Aguinas at, at uh, Keeley Business School have carried out large scale studies. Uh, uh, Aguinas and Boyle's study involved more than half a million subjects. And they analyzed across industries, job types, measurement types, timeframes, and they found that the top performing 5% of people in organizations produce around 26% of the output. And so it's not a normal distribution, it's a Parisian distribution. And I think one of the challenges we have is competence carries with it this baggage of you know building a competence framework, getting people started. And what you see on the screen there is my father's uh, driving license. 
issued by London County Council in uh, 1931. That basically is the way I think a lot of people see competence. We get people to a particular base level. It's a license to operate. In fact, when my father got his driving license in 1931, he didn't even have to pass a test. His the The gateway to competence for driving, in fact, was that he could pay the five shilling fee and he was right to go. So I think that we, we need to think about how we move beyond competence to expertise because experts will drive value creation in our organizations. And I think that AI is changing the nature of work. So a lot of the work that we would have seen that the core sort of competence, the basic work, we're already seeing it, is being embedded in technology. That's been happening for the last 20 or 30 years. I think AI is just uh, accelerating that at great speed. You know, if you're a if you're a jobbing uh if you're a jobbing solicitor, lawyer, doing conveyancing or wills or stuff, you know, I'd be I'd be thinking about doing some other things because we know that that's going to be that, that sort of work is going to be taken over by technology. AI will will really move that on. So I just want to talk about the potential role of AI to support L and D to become real value creators and what that actually means because most L and D functions still operate as cost centers rather than value creators. And I just wanted to to think about what that means in terms of co contributing organized value, organizational value, how we do that, what challenges are we solving? And again, not, not wanting to beat up HR's approach, but I think that a lot of L&D leaders and a lot of L&D folks are still focused very much around individuals and focusing on individual skill levels and developing learning pathways to improve those. Of course, they're important. Individual performance is important, but in today's world, the, the team is the atomic unit of delivery of, of, of what we need to do. Uh, so we need to think above that. In fact, we, we think above, we need to think about the organizational level. And the work we've done at the 702010 Institute in Tulsa is all about how we can focus on organizational requirements, first of all. How do we, how does our organization respond to change? How do we need to deliver customer satisfaction, customer delight, and so on, and then we work backwards. And to that, I think, and, and I noticed that Jos Aritz is actually on this call now, but this model that Jos developed, my colleague Jos developed, this four L&D business models, and some of you may have seen this, but some of you may have known this, but I think this is really useful in terms of understanding this shift that we need to take from a learning mindset focused on individual development, learning value, learning impact, which is really focused around the HR critical elements in terms of from everything from the, the order taking, you know, which is sometimes important because it might be compliance or whatever, but we need to move across to the, to the, the performance mindset where we're thinking about how are we supporting organizational improvement? How are we delivering business value? And of course, that's that's caused lots of hand-wringing in terms of how do we measure, you know, what metrics do we use and so on. And of course, if you're on the left-hand side here in the learning mindset, you're measuring learning, you're, you're measuring learning impact rather than, than business. So I think that this is one of the, uh, this is quite high level, but I think it's one of the key challenges that we have in terms of, of value creation in our organizations and thinking about how AI and how technologies, <coughs> excuse me, are going to, to deliver that. So if we think about traditional L&D value, and I, I use that term traditional very, very intentionally, uh, which is around the, the learning mindset of the story, we're thinking about efficiency, effectiveness, and, and delivery of intended outcomes. We're measuring learning metrics. And in fact, it's it's traditional, but uh, just in, in a couple of months ago, in June this year, the ISO standard 30437 was, was published on learning and development metrics based on David Vance's work. And that still is still focused on the learning mindset. It's not moved across to the real organizational value side of the, of the equation. So I think we just need to, to think about how we're going to add value in the context of delivery of, you know, uh, exceptional quality, uh, high high levels of expertise for task execution and all those sorts of things. And I think there are lots of opportunities to use AI in this way uh, rather than thinking of it in a, in a learning context. So I think the potential for AI to support work rather than learning requires us to think really beyond fixing people, beyond 
isolated learners, beyond isolated learning and isolated employees, and beyond simply creating content, I fear that one of the, the real uh, challenges we have is to think about AI not simply as a tool to produce more content faster. If we, if LD goes down the path of just thinking about using generative AI and other forms of AI just to produce more content faster, I think we really will have missed, missed a significant trick. Uh, we need to focus, I think, on, on using AI to help solve business problems and particularly to support work and tasks at the point of need. And I know that there's a number of us around the world who've been sitting on this or standing on this particular soapbox for many years, talking about why are we not using performance support in a world where we have conduits and access to the right information at the right time? Why are we still trying to put information into people's heads and then hoping that they will remember it when they're out in a different context in the work context? And I think that one of the key opportunities for the exploitation of AI is to focus on using it to support people in the workplace. And again, I know uh, that Jos and colleagues in the Netherlands of uh, developing technologies and developing tools to do this, where we can actually support performance at the point of need. So I think that it's worthwhile just thinking about as leaders, as learning and development leaders, uh, if we step back and think of it systemically, about how we're going to add value. So we need to change our mindsets to a performance mindset, to an output mindset rather than an input mindset of learning. When we're designing our solutions, when we're designing uh, or doing the work we do, we need to co-create the stakeholders. Uh, our applications need to be integrated into the workflow, not just limited to you know, building faster carriages. You know, We need to just formal learning, learning. We need to actually embed that in the workflow. And the tools we're using, uh, and particularly the AI tools need to be able to help solve business problems, not just for producing more learning content. So I just want to finish off by saying that I, I think it's worthwhile going back a few years. If we go back, you know, 20 plus years to Gary Rumler and Alan, Alan Brash's works, uh, they found that they identified that 90% of performance gaps in organizations are caused by organizational barriers, not by knowledge deficits. And in fact, we need to think about this whole challenge holistically. So how can we use these new tools and technologies to help grease the wheels, to make sure that performance is improved, to make sure that tasks, critical tasks are executed well, are executed in the way that they need to be executed and that the organizational barriers are removed rather than simply focusing on, on just building you know, competence in organizations, because uh, I, I've never seen an expert delivered from a formal training program. I've never in my life spoken to someone who's been through a formal training program and at the end of it will have held, have held their hands up and say, yeah, I, I've, I'm an expert, I've got expertise. Of course, expertise comes through experience, through practice, through all sorts of other things. It, it Sure, we can build the, get the, the scaffolding in, through the formal formal training, but we need to do all these all these other things. So that's just some thoughts around where I think AI really has a potential to to supercharge what we do. And, and thanks, Charles. And I think actually there was great a great point um, made by Darren Clark, which actually leads really nicely into into my section. So yeah, you know, Darren, you make the point about um, I guess cost being one of the barriers that's stop people maybe moving from performance support at speed. So. That's that's one of the issues and a few of the other things that I, I think we're now we're now talked to. Um, and again, I think Charles, there might be a couple of questions for you in the Q and A, and also we'll, we'll have a session at the end. I think we'll have we should have fifteen minutes left at the end for people to throw questions in and to get through. So um, on this part here, I guess what I, it's been almost a year now, I guess since ChatGPT has accelerated AI. I mean, we had AI before, but what we've seen obviously in the last year is a speed of innovation that's gone crazy, right? That um, generative AI has forced, if you like, and ChatGPT and OpenAI have forced, I guess, all the other tech vendors to accelerate their offerings to market. And I think now that we've, uh, companies like ourselves in, in Skyhive, which had you know, a lot of our systems integrated with data and AI at the beginning of it, we're now realizing there are old problems we can solve faster and there are new problems or problems that we deemed were unsolvable that can now be solved. And I'm gonna, 
touch on some of these, but bearing in time, we won't be able to touch on all of them. So the challenge to, to uh, transition to modern learning, the problems with language as a barrier, data democratization, personalization, um, moving away from this kind of one dimensional course being the only way to get through foundational learning um, and then some of that more admin stuff. If I start and I think, you know, hitting and it's um, uh, I've got to take a step back here, recognizing I'm talking about 70, 2010 and five moments with Charles uh, as a webinar speaker and Bob <laughs> answering questions in the, in the chat. So I'll be careful uh, to touch on your, your, your ground safely here. So I think most of the people I think dialing in are probably already lovers of the both concepts. Right. And I think both concepts at the heart are about designing learning for value and about recognizing that access to knowledge doesn't necessarily be, be to trained all up front. Um, but actually should be, once you figure out your value, should then be considered and we have to think about actually what do we not train, what do we not put into a course, what do we only make available at point of need. Um, and it's with that thinking in mind, and first of all, to refresh why we love Five Moments and 70, 20, 10, uh, our concepts, because those companies we've seen over the years that have adopted it achieve this type of thing, right, which is in essence, they reduce the amount of upfront training, so they remove, they move away from that kind of everything's about brain stuffing. They move towards more, more content is available in the flow of work. And then what they see from that generally is two parameters. One is a team level will rise. So the average KPI of that team, be it net promoter score or revenue or right first time will, will increase because people are consistently able to get to the best answer at point of need. So that transfer from understanding to application is as small as possible. And I know both Bob and Charles are massive advocates of that. Um, and then the second thing we see is people's ability to get to that high level is in a fraction of the time, often around 300% faster, utilizing the adoption of these great kind of learning frameworks. But to the question, though, um, what happens when they don't apply? What we see is people trying to remember from their head. Um, so that instead of actually accessing that performance support, learning the flow type information, they're guessing, they're asking somebody nearby, and that's where we see errors, inconsistencies, uh, and mistakes come in, which lowers the performance of the team. But then the big question is, so if we're huge lovers of this, why isn't everyone doing it, right? Why is still so few companies really adopting these, these great models? And I think, you know, as a practitioner of both of these, I think it comes down to, and I think as Darren Clark has mentioned, it, it's predominantly cost. You know, realistically, um, the technology up until now hasn't really existed to use the existing content as is. It needs a transformation of that content away from those 100 page training manuals, the 70 page standard operating procedures, the one hour e-learning courses. Generally speaking, to create that flow optimized content, we have to reformat that content into, into new formats. And it's that transition and that transformation and the costs associated with that and the skilling up of teams to do that in a different way, design content in a different way, I believe is part of the barrier to actually democratizing uh, five moments in 7 to 2010. So if we think about what AI is now doing for us, you know, doing for our clients and, and will increase to do over the next, the next six to 12 months, it's the introduction of allowing these concepts to happen without having to actually do that heavy lifting work, but allowing the technology and the AI to do the heavy lifting. So what I mean by that, if you look at what, for example, Fuse clients have today, um, if they have a LinkedIn library, a Fuse access towards it and other systems, they're able to have that front door approach of search. So like a YouTube style of search, across all their assets. So if you typed in three types of coaching conversations in Fuse, or you typed in how to create a pivot table, it wouldn't find a course, you wouldn't look for just the course for that. It'd also say, is there a bite-sized piece of content? Is there an element within a course, a video in a LinkedIn learning course, for example, that explains that, and it would recommend that based on, a, on a, an algorithm which understands and has used machine learning to understand the metadata, to rank that content based upon a whole variety of variables. So that's been used today, and that's step one, which is creating that super index, if we like, to be able to have one place and to have accurate search for all the, the assets. The second stage now is, is what we're introducing to our clients uh, into testing uh, this quarter, which is Google's AI uh, across the content. So this is where, this, this is what, this is actually Google's AI we have on the web, um, which means instead of having to reformat that 100 page Panasonic manual, you just put the manual into the platform as is, and it indexes it, it crawls the content inside it, and it makes that content into um, text-based content, whether that's video or manuals, that can, out answers can be searched for. And specifically, this is about Google AI extracted answers. So extraction means if the content exists and the paragraph exists, it's going to try to match the best paragraph, the best, the best word, the best information. 
to to that to that answer. So how do I switch on autofocus in the S1 camera? It's using Google's uh, AI language, natural language, so it understands it's a question. I'm going to bring back an answer, not not a course, not a video, and I'm going to extract out what I believe is the best power graph from the best document. So if you like, this is the first way we're now starting to accept the fact that we don't need to reformat all of our contents and we're starting to enable the democratization of performance support in seven to 20, 10, five moments. If then we look at the, the next phase, which is generative answers as a form of um, performance support. So this is when now what the difference between generative and extracted is generative means that it's going to try to create an answer from a multitude of documents. So if there's two or three different documents the answer exists inside, it can now pull together those two, three documents and then synthesize the answer into, for example, maybe a list of bullet points into a structure that it thinks is easy to under understand. But it's using the same concepts as the, the extracted. It's first of all, indexing all your content, deeply understanding it from phase one. It's then understanding which paragraphs in the document, so that phase two, and then it's now stage three, synthesizing it to make it easier to consume for the end audience. Step four um, is then um, conversational AI. So the, again, this has been now being rolled out by some of the big vendors. Um, we're actually using ourselves inside uh, one of our one of our meeting tools. We use a tool called Fireflies, and it's able to look at my transcript, and then I can ask questions of it, such as um, uh, based upon the transcript I just had, um, how can I improve my meeting etiquette? Normally, it comes back and says, "Turn up on time, don't talk as much." In that, those type of uh, uh, accurate type stuff. So it's, it's it's pretty good at kind of knowing you in terms of that. Step five, we'll maybe carry on later on, make sure we're ready for step five. And that's just a quick summary of those those four, those four first four stages. Step five, if we have time, we'll get to, but we want to make sure you're ready for step five there. So if we hit onto the second point then of using AI to remove other barriers, the other big, you know, so one big barrier is time, right? What performer support does is really impacting time as a problem for learning. And we know, and Charles would obviously talk to this, the smaller the amount of time between learning, understanding, and application of that, of that knowledge, the more chance you're going to apply that in the correct way. The second big issue is language, right? We know there's a massive cost to translating, and also we know that people prefer, and, and uh, for efficacy, will understand better and more likely to understand first time in mother tongue. Just to explain how far the technology has come, because the utopian solution for, for language was always to be able to do this, to be able to have one button we're able to press an, an English. For example, this is a an few school channel, a charity channel. This is a video. You think of summer. I'm sure one of and, and that's actually an AI, an AI voice, which we're now using for our, our YouTube channel, which has five to ten million kids using it a year, but in one button now. It, we're now doing transcription, translation, uh, and AI voice uh, in an automated way. Quando pensate all'estate, sono sicuro che una delle cose che vi vengono in mente. So I'm not sure how many Italians there are, um, but the, but what we we basically have now in terms of technology is these are four levels to get to that that utopian. So what we what we have seen in the last six to twelve months is a huge increase in the quality of the AI for speech to text, and that's really important for multiple reasons. If your accuracy on on speech to text is better, you're more able to move straight into using that text for automatic translation. If that's more accurate, you're more able to then to use AI to actually make a voice in those different languages. And again, now the technology exists for us to use the best in class uh, speech to text, best in class text to text and better class text. And they're all different technologies, but automatically behind the scenes, uh, those things are extracted, separated, added, and given us an accuracy level that's unparalleled before that starts to now to really put a massive reduction uh, into, our, into our translation costs and allow mother tongue. And this is just an example. This is what we were using, or, or actually are using just moving away from, which is using Microsoft's AI on the left-hand side. You can see on the same transcripts here, the, the, where mistakes are made, like torches talk through us, whereas the newer machine learning is now getting us this 99.8% accuracy. So a huge, I mean, those little differences of a full stop or a comma in the right place obviously makes a huge difference when the technology is then going straight into text-to-text -text translation. And that, again, what we have seen, again, we're just switching our, our provider, and what we're seeing in the new, new technologies is a three times increase in accuracy um, on that part towards it. 
So we're getting really, really, really close to the majority of our content. We can allow it to be used automatically and even adding the audio to the video. And then on the, on the AI to voice piece, what we're now seeing is a, a massive increase in the last three to six months alone. And this is just showing where we are and kind of where the technology is in this like, text to voice. Yeah, the ability to- all be thankful for those people who can handle the inner spirit. Everyone thinks of changing the world. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. So th these are all AI voices you just choose. You can obviously clone your own people, clone your own voice with obviously the right ethic types capabilities towards it. Um, but it allows us now this, this capability to have mother tongue learning in an in a almost invisible price, uh, which is truly exciting. So maybe just to move into the um, the, the final section, then we'll go back into, into questions and answers which is, I think, again, a tremendously exciting area around personalization, because personalization does connect to engagement and engagement does connect to performance. What we do see, if people, for example, adopt a five moments or a 7 20, 10, uh, 70 rather than a 7, a 70 20, 10 type approach, what we do want them doing is using performance support on a regular basis, not necessarily going through a whole course, but going to the bit they need to get the answer they want. So now instead of measuring how much time they're spending, we're, we're measuring how frequently they go and actually use the technology for curiosity, to answer questions, or to carry on carry on formal learning. So for us, it's the choice that people are, are saying there is value in the technology and I'm going there frequently. And it's a measurement of the frequency and the habit that we're now using as the main correlation to see, is there a correlation between people who have modern learning habits and actually performance. And that becomes the main data point that we push and we drive on a day-to-day -day basis. So when we talk about personalization, what do we really mean, right? And put, and this I think is insanely interesting, right? It's hard not to get overly excited sometimes, I, I think through the breakthroughs here. Uh, ultimately, you know, personal skills gaps is one level of personalization. Preferred language, mother tongue language, you know, it may be that I'm learning Italian, but I don't learn mathematics great in Italian because cognitively I've got to put a lot of brain time into thinking that way. My neurology makes a big difference towards it. If I'm autistic, I'm ADHD, um, I have a, you know preferences around that part. My knowledge gap versus my skills gap, my context, my role, my job, my location, all of those things are around personalization. So when we think about when we think about creating this, this type part, sorry I'm sure I didn't skip one slide. Um, so just to make that point, I think often yeah, we do bash learning styles and learning preferences to the extent some degree that we eliminate it and we say none of that exists. I mean, just to help the part, you know, I'm, I'm neurodivergent, um, but just to help this part to understand neurodivergence in learning preferences, as a person with ADHD, I definitely prefer shorter learning, right? You know, it's heavy for lengthy content, is, is hard for an ADHD person. So bite size we love, and generally we're more social people. So we also love that. Whereas an autistic person, you know, is more structured by detail. As a trainer, sometimes it's always, it's hard in a classroom. How do you deliver a great training experience for someone who's autistic and someone that's ADHD? The same for a learning pathway or a performance pathway. One thing that's gonna be great for an autistic person, probably not gonna be great for an ADHD person. Likewise, dyslexic person's unlikely gonna to wanna to read last mate's Martin Matter text, but they're much more gonna prefer visual learning or probably problem solving. So I, I do believe there are differences and we are unique. And we need the flexibility in how we teach and how we deliver learning and deliver knowledge and the performance to match those different neologies. And, and then when I, I think about, I guess, trying to simplify learning moments, I often think about them in these phrases. So the structured and career path learning, the contextual in the moment, I've got a problem, I need an answer, and that curiosity and social learning piece. And how does that come into personalization? And this is where I think, again, it's where in an amazing world of AI to be able to solve this problem at its nth degree. And I think we are, we're moving there. So the left-hand side, you have all of that information about the individual, the person. And the more I understand about that person, I can model that person, and I'll understand where they are in that context at the moment, the more I'm likely to match the content if I deeply understand the content and all the metadata to do with that content. So if I understand my, my child and what knowledge gap they may have in mass around fractions, they may be in year 12, but actually they have a gap on a year eight concept that's blocking their understanding. That knowledge gap is what's going to allow them to start building the, the capability. And then later on, maybe that skill to, to fly a plane, which that mass knowledge is needed. So the more we understand about the individual, 
the more we're able to actually uh, to personalize the experience across those three layers, whether that's taking a skills gap, looking at the, all the content we have available and then structuring it to my career path learning, or potentially that I'm looking at, I'm contextual in the moment. I'm, I've got a problem. I'm on a screen in, in uh, Salesforce. I press a button. It knows who I am. It knows what role I've got. It knows what I'm currently doing. It knows what content I'm doing. Therefore, it's going to predict and recommend that learn to me through a browser extension, through to that curiosity-based learning of, again, that says, I know what you're interested in. I know what you clicked on. I know what you liked. I know your skills gaps, your knowledge gaps. I know all the content that's new, that's fresh. So the fresh, newer content, I'm going to more recommend to you to create that habit to go back on a frequent basis. And if we look, maybe take the first one, this is where Skyhive and us, you know, are having this integrated journey. So Skyhive, for example, would do that amazing work and knowledge around understanding the individual and their skills gaps, which does include um, potentially, you know, task knowledge gaps as well. That's then passed into, um, into our platform. And what we're basically doing is auto tagging all the content that is, exists out there from different platforms, from Udemy, from LinkedIn, from SAP, and tagging content and views to basically then make that match. To say, based upon you as individual, with, for example, your five skills gaps, let's say theoretically I had one on active listening, it's going to understand that because that's what Sky High says I have a gap on. That's a key skill of today, along with prompt engineering, because that it recognizes I should know about that. And it's automatically, dynamically going to be connecting in and recommending that to us. Um, and then to the curiosity and, and the social feed. So that, that other moment of lead, how do we get people to come back? Search is one way, right? So um, one way we want people to come back is because people are, are know they're going to find the best answer there. Just like you know the best answer on the public web, this is where you would want to believe in your corporate platform that I'm going to have the best knowledge for the best people, internal and external, to find to allow me to do my job better. But at the same time, I also want to be inspired. I want to be inspired to, um, to be able to... Um, go to the platform and knowing it understands me and it's going to find stuff that it thinks is interesting and going to recommend that stuff to me based upon my job, my gaps, what's changing, all of those, those type of things for it. So let me, let me pause and let me park um, before I jump into um, uh, the last part, if I get time, which is a, a really exciting topic around democratization of data and, and talking to our platforms to ask questions of it. So uh, maybe lots of, um, things come through. Any questions we want to jump into that, that comes out there? Anyone ask a quick question of Charles or Sean or myself or that's come through in the chat? Okay, there's a good question at the end there. And there may be a question for both myself and, and all, th all three of us here, right? So for Charles and Sean. So this question says, this all sounds like sy systematic change. Um, as I say that carefully. How do we convince businesses that an overall shift is needed or required to create the buy-in. Charles, I think you want to take that first. I know this is a passionate subject for you. Well, I, I, I think it's a real, it's a big challenge because uh, as my friend and colleague, Jay Cross often said, uh, you know, because we've all been through school and formal education, it's very difficult to separate learning from schooling because, you know, people rise up through their organization and they assume that, uh, that learning means formal structured learning and therefore we build a whole ecosystem around formal structured learning and everyone's happy uh, because you know they produce the data in terms that there's lots of formal structured learning happening there. So I think it does require a rethink, a really systemic change because if you move, to come back to Jos Arad's model, if you move from the learning mindset to the performance mindset, that really helps you start because you know we all know that learning is just part of a process in order to deliver improved, continuous improvement, improved performance at organizational level, team level, and individual level. And I think once we start to think about that, and once we start to, I guess, educate our leaders into thinking about that, rather than thinking about, you know, well, we have a budget for our, our training and development or learning and development each year. And as long as we've got lots of activity going on, you know, we're happy with that. Uh, I think it does require a systemic change in terms of, of thinking about about that and for me it's very much around changing that mindset from a learning mindset to a performance mindset sean do you want to add in before i before i jump in sure uh thanks steve so um you know in in every significant ceo survey in the last 12 months uh this top 
topic has been top of mind for uh, virtually most C, you know, C-suite leaders uh, across the planet. And really, you, you, in its most simplest form, we have to do the job of answering one of two questions or both questions. One, how does transforming my workforce lead to increased revenue? Or how does transforming my workforce reduce cost? And it's really about bringing this discussion up to the business objective level uh, and, and highlighting that. And the good news is there has never been more data available than there is today to actually substantiate those business plans and those business cases. And I, and I think there would be an argument that we'd all agree with that you know, we've we've perhaps as an industry struggled to find uh, to define value and and return on investment previously simply because the data wasn't available. But today, we have that information available. We have those models and methodologies that have been used by you know the leading companies and and, and organizations that have transitioned or have begun transition and transformation. And so it's really about building the community of thought leadership and best practice and driving business objectives. And I think so. If I if I come towards that, because I do think this is a great conversation. I do think the first part of the answer is we have to understand that learning functions and business functions talk two different languages. And if, for example, let's say learning is talking Swedish, um, and uh, the business is talking German, if we're talking Swedish to the Germans, right, we have a translation problem. So if we're talking engagement, learning culture. Um, the, the things that are not hard metrics, then the business is, isn't going to say to us, let's invest in a, in a new transition or a new way forward. So it is a new skill set, I think, for um, L&D practitioners to be able to, to switch that. So when we're talking to ourselves, yeah, we are talking learning culture. We are talking that part towards it. But the same bit, we need to have the data to Sean's point to correlate and prove the things we're talking about are going to have a direct impact on the things the business is important. And ideally, at the same bit, also reducing costs, which is why, for example, in our core proposition, that translation is the heart of it, right? In the child of it, that's a big way we can say in investments of views, you can try, you can use translation as a way to reduce the cost. But the performance bit, whatever that, that key goal is, we believe and we can show you that if people use performance support, they use social learning, they update their, their knowledge and their skills on a frequent basis, we can prove that if people are doing that frequently, then they are performing higher than the people that are not. So I think the data point is 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 absolutely key, um, and in an ideal world, each program is designed back from that value. But even if it's not, I think overall the overarching metric. And I remember Charles, like you know, twenty years ago, at, at, at Reuters used to get crazy when people say to you that you know, um, how do you do this this year? And you know, twenty thousand days we delivered, and and obviously now what we're that's not to say engagement's not bad. But if we can correlate the type of engagement with the, with actually the performance we're driving to, it has meaning. But alone, it has no meaning. Charles, yeah, you're going to say. You know, I was just going to say, just agree with you. I think that you know a lot of the metrics that are used are, in fact, meaningless. And and Steve, you you mentioned you know 20 years ago, I would say that uh, if an organisation is delivering X number of hours of, of formal learning every year, what does it tell us? It tells you if the number is X is larger than last year, it tells you either that you've become less efficient at doing it or your recruitment department is recruiting the wrong uh, capabilities and they need it. So it, it or it could be that, uh, you know, that you're really focused on on building capability. You just don't know. It's it's sort of a it's shot in the dark, really. So that meaning that 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 sort of data is really meaningless. I think you have to look at it from the organizational level. Think about are we increasing agility? Are we ensuring that, well, I go back to Brad Benson, who was the chief of staff at Intel, uh, had a conversation with him many years ago. And Brad said it's a very simple uh, formula in terms of if the the speed of learning of an organ at organizational level is greater than the speed of internal and external change, the output is success. If the speed of learning at organizational level is less than or equal to the speed of change, the output is organizational failure. You know, it's really as simple as that. Uh, but I think you have to measure it in terms of business terms and business outputs. Just a couple of other questions that came in, just want to grab into. So one was a just a quick answer. How do we, how do you work? Oops. Um, 
there was a how do you work with the AI model flagging correct interaction? So in the the uh, the release that's coming, there's like a thumbs down, thumbs up button, which in which um, informs the machine learning part. So that then informs that that question is a higher category top towards it. And we also have a function coming through, which is if somebody asks a question, somebody marks it, somebody officially can say that's the official answer. And then again, that then boosts that answer and matches the, the boosts the, the match, if you like, between that question and that, that answer. Um, the other question that came with, which I love, uh, which was how should schools change now uh, that we have the tech and know-how? L- let me start and then pass off because I've got, I've got kids that are uh, twins that are 10 and a uh, 11 year old. And it's been amazing to be using both our few school content, you know, the, the mass content we have, but also generative AI to understand, to be able to test out really quickly what they, what we know and don't know, to find the skills gaps towards it. And it is really evident, right, to that level of personalization that all the technology exists now to allow, whereas we've democratized access to knowledge in the last 10 years with our, our content, I think now all that technology exists to model a child's brain what they know and don't know along with their preferences and then be able to immediately say well if you didn't understand it this way because a good trainer right a good teacher or trainer the maybe the sixth time they taught a course would be the best time one of the best the first time's the worst time sixth time you kind of get how it should be and you also you have two or three examples of explanations that help the child or the adult understand a concept because not, not everyone's going to understand the same concept the same way in technology that's been quite hard to do and now we can do that, right? So now we can say, well, because I know you're interested in anime or, or superheroes, let me change the explanation in context of the world you understand. So the degree of personalization we can now give uh, and schools can now do, but I do think the schools will run slower than the, the actual commercial companies. I think the you know, schools and governments are gonna be slow, um, even the most, the most evolved ones such as the MOE. Other questions coming in. Uh, uh, maybe the last, we well, last one or two questions coming in. So uh, Detlef, I still wonder how we can automate, if at all. This is a really good one, right? The extraction of tacit knowledge in the experts to make it available and leverage it for AI. Uh, and again, I've got an opinion, but I, I'd love to other guys go first. So do you guys want to have a shot at that first before I dive into to Detlef's question, which is how do we automate, if possible, or as much as possible, the extraction of tacit knowledge? I'll take silence as an opportunity then. <laughs> so actually, Sean, I did this actually, it's a great example, right? I actually did this with your uh, one of your Martin guys, Todd, who's on the call. So um, with Todd, for example, we wanted to create a joint proposition video between Skyhive and Fuse. So we had our expert, uh, Ryan, who um, has an amazing uh, technique he's learned over the years to ask the questions to extract out that knowledge, which normally would be the first part of the video. Again, using AI here, Ryan could ask the questions. The AI is automatically transcribing it. Afterwards, we simply asked a question that said, can you now create a 600 word script based upon the conversations that myself and Todd have that based upon what's the value proposition we're gonna to get to. So, and, and to be fair, it, it did a job that's probably 70, 80% of the way towards that. So the ability to summarize, we did it one the other week as well. We got the sales team all to pitch a new proposition we had. We then mouse the AI after it. Can you now consolidate the best examples from across the pitches into the best video, which we all agreed was the, was the best version of our script between that. So I don't think we get the whole way there, right? They're doing it automatically, unless you put, you know, one of Elon Musk's devices distracted to our heads. But I think the acceleration of getting the explanations out and then the ability to personalize that, where, where we just had to figure out a little bit longer how to how to automate that in a way that reduces the process by. any other questions we got any before I take up any more air guys because um Charles and or Sean any final points you want to make before maybe I ask answer the last questions we see coming through here Steve I was just going to make a comment about the about Kieran Ward's question about how should schools change yeah I think there's to be honest, I think schools and and universities are really facing an existential uh, challenge here, uh, because you know they're based on a, a sort of medieval idea about the holders of knowledge and so on. And to a certain extent, uh, when children are 
are young, they go into an experiential, you know, they go into their primary school or their kindergarten or whatever, and they have experience. There's a lot of it, learning is all about experiential and so on. And the more you more you advance through the educational system, the more you sort of go backwards in time into uh, into, you know, pouring information into people's heads, expecting them to retain it and, and regurgitate it. And I think it's a, a challenge in that they haven't really addressed issues of the early technologies yet. And in fact, here in the UK, we've just had our Minister for Education yesterday uh, very proudly announced that, you know, children were going to be banned from taking mobile phones into school. Uh, and so we're sort of working against that sort of mentality. And I don't know what they're going to do in, in you know, 15 years time. And as you say, Steve, you know, where there'll be implants or whatever. Uh, but, you know, we need, I think it's a, it's a major, major challenge in terms of how we prepare children. And, and for me, the answer is that you know you you provide them with as many experiences as you possibly can, and you you get back into that you know helping them to be able to assimilate information, to be able to take uh, uh, to to analyze data, uh, to understand you know where this correlation, where this causality, those sorts of things. They're they're sort of fundamental capabilities rather than uh, you know the the stuff that is done in lots of schools, you know, secondary schools uh, today. Yeah, I, I I think that um, I think the schools are going to take their time. I, I think to to towards understanding how to utilize utilize this. I think the kids though are going to work it out pretty quick, and I think companies uh, like ourselves, right, and others are going to start to. I mean, the, the difference between building technology with some of the new AI LLMs, right, is what would took us two years is sometimes taking us six weeks. So I think we're going to see a massive acceleration of companies, edtech companies and learning tech companies utilizing this AI to allow that personalization to happen so that 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 AI is is helping the learning experience, not just be the single dimensional structure, um, but it being understanding the child, the preferences, the interest and all those type of things. So I do think what we see is as we published a whole bunch of free content on YouTube and have all that amazing feedback, I think we'll start to see that the technologies of the tech giants or people utilize the tech giants to um, to now go to that next level. I think we're at time over, guys, and uh, really appreciate um, the, the wisdom, the experience of, of Sean, of Charles, of the great questions. I, I think that came through, some great questions, and you've got great practitioners. It's good to see you, Debbie. Good to see you, Bob. I mean, there's some great, uh, Diane as well. Um, so amazing questions and amazing audience we have. I think we're, we're as, um, as lucky to have the, the audience that we have as we had the speakers. So thank you again for, for Sean and Charles for um, hosting the session. And uh, the webinar will be available on demand uh, tomorrow. Uh, we'll send that out to everyone that registered. So um, hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you on the next one.